Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. What an awesome day this is. And, um, you know, I was told quite a few years ago by somebody that Easter tends to be that day that many, many ministers know as the Super Bowl of, of Sundays for, for that minister. I don't know if you've ever heard that before or not, but uh, that minister also said the problem is, is you can't think about that Super Bowl going into overtime and you have a very short play clock because people want to get back to their meals that they're going to be taking, you know, eating together and, and so on. And, and I, uh, I thought, you know what, that, that makes a lot of sense. However, I believe that each day, each day that we have is the regular season. Each, each day that we have counts for something. And that means that each day spent on this earth we need to understand that that's an opportunity for us to be able to, to preach that gospel and, and share the gospel with so many. And I wonder how many of us kind of take that approach to it. Uh, I'm, again, I'm so glad that so many are here, uh, so many who have been, been sick and traveling, and, and uh, just glad to have you back. Uh, we, we also just came back from, from a cruise, as many of you all know, and I was very happy uh, to have somebody, uh, Roy Goodlett, filled in for me last week. And um, uh, from what I understood, uh, shared a, a very good message, and and I uh, was very thankful to have him step in. And uh, while we were out there, kind of in the middle of the uh, middle of the ocean, and uh, going to different countries, and I'll tell you, it really, um, it really opens your eyes to the world when you go on a cruise. It really does, especially when you go to places like like Mexico. And as we were driving, uh, we were going to one of these these ruins that were out there. Uh, we happened to drive by this. Uh, this graveyard, and out in Mexico, because the, the land is so low, uh, the, the graves are actually, you know, and the, and the vaults are actually above ground. They can't bury them too low. And, and they were really colorful. They actually had these, these different grave sites colored, and, and the vaults were colored different colors. And a bunch of them were actually colored this blue color. And the, the taxi driver that was taking us, he said, look over there. He said, those vaults are, are blue. And, and I was like, why are they blue? And he said, well, because they believe that the blue color will help um, bring about a reincarnation. And that, was, that was their belief, is that um, if they was, it was a blue color that they would paint, that that would help towards that idea. And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, you know, the great thing is we don't have to worry about reincarnation because we have resurrection, amen? We have resurrection, and that's something that we can count on. Uh, we don't have to paint anything a color for that to happen. We, we are grateful for the fact that Jesus was sent so that we could have that, so that we could have that. And many people don't truly understand that. Yesterday I went out to, uh, to lunch with my family, and uh, it was uh, really nice. And uh, we, uh, the, the, the lady who was uh, waiting on us, we, we said, are, are you guys going to be working on Easter? And she said, no, actually, um, tomorrow they, they have the day off, and they really haven't had that off in a while. And she said, because the Greek Easter falls on the same day as, as Easter that we celebrate. And at first I thought, I didn't even know that there was a Greek Easter or a separate time for Easter, but apparently there was. And she said, you know, I'm a little bummed, though. And I, and I was like, why, why are you bummed? It's Easter and you get the day off. She said, well, normally because we're about a week or two behind regular Easter, we get all the candy marked off 50% and that kind of thing. So she was a little bummed over the fact that they weren't able to get this discount, that they had to pay full price. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I don't know if that's the way I would look at Easter, but hey, got the day off and, and that sort of thing. But you know, I thought it was just very interesting the, the approach that we take to Easter. And you know, you go on Facebook and, and you know, every other uh, place is having an Easter egg hunt. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great time for the kids. It, it really is. But, you know, the more, I guess, uh, maybe, maybe it's just the, the more I've been looking at, at um, our world in general. You know, I, I still believe that we as a church are the ones that are supposed to be leading this world. Amen. We are supposed to be doing that. And what tends to happen is now the church is allowing the world to lead them. And I think all of us can, can agree with that, that that's what we've seen. We take the idea of an Easter egg, and we call it a resurrection egg because the Easter egg just doesn't quite fit. But there, you know, we try to form things that have happened from the world and, and turn it into something that we can use rather than the opposite. And this is an issue that we have really throughout the church as a whole. But today, today, we are talking about something that is amazing. We are celebrating Easter Sunday. 
and, and people all over the world are gathering together and they are talking about the resurrection of Jesus because that is what happened. That is, that is an amazing part and we are a part of that celebration. And today our main scripture is going to be found in Matthew 28, 1 through 10. So I would invite you to, to open your Bibles if you'd like to. It's also going to be on the screen and behind me as we read. But let's open up with this scripture because, again, God's word is the most powerful thing that we can say, that we can read. Uh, I have a, a relative of mine who's actually a, um, he's a, a pastor or a minister up, up in the north, uh, northeast somewhere. And um, he put a message out and he said, for all those ministers out there that think that they want to take over the message for this Sunday, don't do it. Allow the word to speak for itself. And I, I said, you know what? There's a lot of truth to that because we do try to take over messages, don't we? But God's word is powerful. It speaks to us in amazing ways. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So Matthew 28, 1 through 10, you can follow along in your Bible and, and uh, listen carefully as I read these familiar verses to you. And what it says is that after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now, you know, Michelangelo observed that when he visited several great art galleries in, in different cities that, uh, throughout Europe, he, he said he was deeply impressed by the, the overwhelming number of paintings that show Jesus hanging on the cross. And listen, the cross is that symbol of Christianity. The cross is what we know because without the cross, we would not have that relationship with God. Amen? But... Michelangelo asked, he said, why are art galleries filled with so many pictures of Christ upon the cross? Christ dying. Why do artists concentrate upon that passing episode as if that were the last word and final scene? See, Christ dying on the cross lasted for only a few hours. But to the end of unending eternity, Christ is alive. Christ is alive. So in other words, the crucifixion, which is vital and critical to, to our salvation, it has grabbed our attention. But what about the resurrection? What about the resurrection? Did, did it have any value? Was the idea of resurrection important? I mean, these are, these are questions that we need to ask because, again, we look at the cross of the symbol. However, the resurrection is something that we need to be focused on. Amen? We have to. The idea of the resurrection was so important, listen to this, that the chief priests and the Pharisees, they did everything to make sure that no resurrection would ever take place. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. They did everything they could to make sure there was no risen king. And we see the precautions that were actually taken by these priests and the Pharisees when we read in Matthew 27, uh, 62 to 66. So read this with me. And this passage tells us that the next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what the imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. 
Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away. And tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. Now listen to that. We've kind of jumped back a little bit before this, this main passage we've talked about. We've talked about the preparation that was, that was done, that was made, in order to make sure that nobody could get in, nobody could get out, that there were people watching this 24-7, that there's no possible way that people could even steal the body or anything like that. They wanted to make sure this was not going to happen. Understand their intention. They wanted no hint of resurrection. They wanted no hint of a resurrected Jesus. So they went to Pilate and they requested a guard. They thought if the body was stolen, they'd have real problems. <laughs> they'd have real problems. And why? Because Jesus had predicted that he would rise from the dead. Now, as long as Jesus' body was still in the tomb, and it, it, what would happen is it would crush any further potential power that his movement had. And they could take uh, people over to the tomb and say, hey, look, it's the body, and, and, and there's Jesus. They could say, look, here is Jesus' body. And, you know, there was a, um, a Muslim man that uh, was boasting about his religion to a Christian. And he said, you know what? You don't even have a place that you can go and, and I, I can take you to the gravesite of Muhammad and, and show you that is, our, that is our prophet. He is the man who we follow. And you know the Christian said, he's like, there's nothing to boast about. I have nowhere to go because my Christ is risen. He has defeated death. But they said, they could say, look, here's this body. Here's Jesus. He's dead. He's dead. And if it was still in that tomb, that, if he was still dead, that would prove that he was a liar. That the things that he said were not true because he said he was going to rise again. However, if the body wasn't in the grave and, any longer and, and suddenly these Jewish leaders would have nothing to show for it, and nothing for really, even show and tell. That's kind of the way I look at it. It's almost like, this is show and tell. Look, here's, here's the body of Jesus. He is not your Savior. He is not the Son of God, because his body's right there. He said he's going to rise, and he didn't. So these leaders, these chief priests and these Pharisees, they went to Pilate, and they got a Roman guard. And why would they go to Pilate in the first place? Because Roman soldiers were the best soldiers in the world. Okay, these, these soldiers were well-trained, and you know that they would not desert their post even if death was facing them. They would not desert their posts. So they went to this Roman guard, and they said, you need to stand here. You need to be here. They went to the tomb, these Jewish leaders. They made sure the body was still there. They rolled back the stone in place, and, and they sealed it with a Roman seal. And then they went home, and they went to bed only to wake up a couple days later and find out that they had failed, amen. They had failed. How amazing is that? They'd failed. And why had they failed? Because no Roman guard, no Roman legion was going to keep Jesus around, amen? No way. It's a fact that an entire Roman legion could not have got that done. They could have posted an entire army outside that tomb and they could not have gotten that done. I mean, just think about what has just happened here, okay? Let's start with this violent earthquake that, that we read about. Now, science tell, scientists actually tell us that experiencing an earthquake is, is almost like you have these uncontrollable feelings. You have no control over what you are doing. And it's a feeling of, of insecurity. And because, because what they know is, is solid ground. It's not moving underneath them. 
I sort of felt that way when I was on the boat, by the way. You know, you're kind of rocking back and forth. And, and then when you get off the boat and you, you come to land, you, you find yourself rocking back and forth as you're walking around. Hey, how are you doing? You know, so good to see you. You know, and, and you realize that, why are you wobbling? Because I'm fine, right? Okay, but, but they have no control. No control whatsoever. They're helpless to do anything about it. And right in the midst of this earthquake, an angel appears. An angel appears. His appearance was like lightning. Lightning. He rolls away the stone from the entrance of the tomb, and he sits on that stone. I, mean, I just, can you imagine that? It's almost like, hey, watch this, guys. I'm going to roll the stone. I'm just going to sit on it, and I'm going to come like, yep. Look what I just did. Y'all think you can stop me? I'm an angel. I'm just going to sit up on this stone, and I'm going to look at you guys because there's nothing you can do to stop me, okay? Nothing you can do. <laughs> so we get back to these selected guards. They were tough, and they were understanding. Okay, yeah, battery's starting to go. Any better. We good? Can y'all hear me? Okay. We'll get it worked through. I can project a little bit here. That's okay. I've got practice with that. So so back to those guards. They felt the earthquake. And they saw the angel, and they became so afraid when they saw this angel that they shook, and they became like dead men. They became like dead men. God, you have to understand that God was shaking much more than the earth that morning. He was shaking a lot more. He shook those hardened soldiers too. He shook them. And I wonder, did the angel roll the stone away to let Jesus out? Did he do that? Because here's the thing, is that the tomb was already empty. People don't realize that. He rolled the stone, you know, the angel rolled the stone away. The tomb is already empty. The angel did not roll the stone away to let Jesus out, but to let the women in so that they could see for themselves that this tomb was empty. He was not there. He was not there. And what about the women? They were afraid too, but their fear turned to joy, and they hurried to tell the disciples that they had, what they had seen and heard, and just as they hurried, suddenly Jesus meets, meets them and says, greetings, greetings. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm running around and I come across somebody that I know had just died, and they say greetings, I'm freaking out a little bit, okay? Like, what in the world just happened here? And that's just the problem. It's not in the world, amen? It is not in the world. It is not of this world. It is of heaven. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. I love that. <laughs> Imagine rounding that corner as you're running and you find, uh, to find those disciples and suddenly there he is. There's Jesus. And he says, greetings. <laughs> Not just a common, ordinary greeting like, hey, good morning, how are you? You know, nothing like that, but, but greetings. What a moment. And, and no wonder why the scripture says that they clasp his feet and they worshiped him. I, I think I'd be doing the same thing. Uh, uh, tomb, no, not there. You're here. Um, what is going on? My world is going crazy here, right? You're alive. You're here. I'd be bound down. Should we not be doing that anyways? Should we not be doing that? Because we know that he is risen, amen? He is risen. He is risen. I have to understand, though, for the Son of God, Resurrection is something that he had been pre preparing for, and not just only in, in his earthly life, but throughout all of history. Throughout all of history. It was part of a plan that was put in action well before that time. And people don't understand that. They think, well, yeah, maybe uh, if we, they didn't crucify Jesus, none of this had to happen. Let me just say this. It had to happen. 
This was part of God's plan, and He was fulfilling this plan. And I thank God for that. He had some earlier practice runs, by the way, as if he really needed them, but he had some earlier practice runs. First, he, he raised uh, Nain's widow's son from the dead, and then he raised uh, the synagogue ruler uh, Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead, and the most famous is when he, he raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. Okay, So he had plenty of practice as far as resurrection uh, went, but this was himself. The two Marys, though, they were filled with joy. Filled with joy. They were celebrating his resurrection. And this morning, I want us to celebrate too, amen? I want us to celebrate too, to celebrate his victory over two terrible foes. Two terrible foes. Let's look at the first. On the cross, and this is in your bulletin, by the way. On the cross, Jesus won the victory over our sin. First foe is sin. Everything that is wrong with our culture today can be labeled with one word, and that word is sin. That's it. Why do we have broken homes and divorced uh, and twisted lives? Uh, why do we have an economy where unethical things seem to flourish and, and dishonesty prospers? And the answer is sin. That's why. Why do we have schools where, where children cannot be disciplined and teachers are afraid to teach? Why do we have metal detectors in some schools and uh, just to make sure that children don't carry knives and guns into those schools? The answer is sin. Why do we have a culture that embraces drug, drug addiction and, and suggests that we should legalize it? Why is homosexuality embraced as an alternate lifestyle? Why is pornography so prevalent? The answer, people, is sin. That's what it is. So what is the solution today? What is that solution? Some have decided to pull their kids out of school and educate them at home um, or put them in special schools because they're convinced the schools will never change. Others give, give in to the dishonesty of our culture and decide that nothing can be done except to build bigger jails, get more abuse centers, and that we'll just have to get used to, to this hateful language because that's the way it is in our world today. And there's not much that can be done about it. Or, or is there? Is there? You see, up until the cross, we were apart from God. We were apart from God. And we had to pay for our sins. Jesus' death, when he died on that cross, it tore it, 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 it tore that veil, okay, that veil that separated us from God and that true relationship that we were supposed to have with Him, amen? That veil was torn. We now were able to be in a relationship with God. And that's the way that God intended for us to, to be, is, is to have a true relationship with Him, not to be separated, not to have to pay for the things that we do wrong. But thank God, when Jesus died on that cross, when he died, that earthly life on, this, on that cross, it tore that veil, it got rid of the separation, and now we can be one with our loving God. Amen. We can do that. You see, sin is all around us. It isn't hopeless, and we're not helpless, because on that cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins, and he won the victory for you and for me, amen? He won that victory. He paid the price. We don't have to pay. It doesn't sound right, does it? It doesn't sound right. Many of us feel like, I've got to pay for something. I'm the one that's doing the wrong here, right? I've got to pay for something. Maybe I could do some good deeds. Well, you know what? Those deeds mean nothing because Jesus paid for us. He paid for us once and for all. Without that, we're as separated as anybody else in this world. Jesus paid the price. The second thing that happened is in his resurrection, Jesus won the victory over death. And this is what we're really going to talk about. Why is that important? Because death is a hated enemy, and here's why. First of all, death has no respect of who you are, by the way. 
It's not like say death will come up to you and say, oh, look, you're Matt Kaladze. I'm just going to leave you alone. It doesn't work that way. Our culture, if you have money, if you have power, if you have position uh, or prestige, you can get the best table in the restaurant. You can possibly maybe get some better things on this planet. You can get special treatment. You can get a better seat at the ballpark. Just because of who you are or what you have. Just because of who you are or what you have on this, this earth is why you get better things. But you know what? That death doesn't care who you are. Death does not care. It strips away all those worldly rewards and says, you're just like everybody else. You're just like everybody else. Sam Walton, you know what? He is a billionaire, but you know what he is right now? He's dead. Uh, Jackie Kennedy, Princess Diana, Mother Teresa. They all died. Because death is not a respecter of persons. Death does not care who you are. It is going to happen to each one of us. We may think at times we're invincible. We may think at times that we can get away with things because, well, I've got plenty of years in my life. Death not a respecter of who you are. And maybe uh, that's why so many people fear death. The book of Hebrews says that there are people who all their lives are held in slavery by their fear of death. They're held in slavery. They're so afraid that if they walk out and they live life, or if they walk out and they, they serve God, or whatever it might be, that they are going to lose their life. They're so afraid of that. I've known people, and uh, maybe you have too, who are afraid to, to write a will or take out an insurance policy or even go to the doctor for fear that that doctor is going to say that they had some sort of fatal disease. I'm a kick-the-can-down-the-road guy myself, I'll be honest with you. I uh, hate going to the doctor. <laughs> and I always tell my wife, it's like, you know, they're just going to tell me there's something wrong because then they can charge me more money and all that kind of stuff, all right? And... I'm, I'm, yes, I'm the doctor conspiracy theorist. That's how it works. Okay? Same thing with a dentist. I've got teeth. They're fine, right? I mean, come on. You know, and, and you know, if you go in there, they're going to find something wrong because that's how they make their money. That is my conspiracy theory. We don't want to go into these doctors and have them tell us something is wrong, especially something as serious as a life-threatening disease or having them tell us that we don't have long to live. That's a fear that all of us have. People cannot bring themselves to face the subject of death, so they try to avoid it altogether. <clears throat> but here's the thing. second part of this is that death is a sneaky enemy. <clears throat> it often comes unannounced, without warning. It snatches babies. It takes children. It strikes down people in the prime of their lives. And that's why James wrote in, in James 4.14, he said, Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Think of that picture. You wake up in the morning and you're driving down the road and it's a little foggy and you see that mist. That is what he's saying. We're like that mist that's there one second and then a couple minutes later it's gone. That's how it is on this earth. This earthly life that we live. <clears throat> Third thing about death is that death constantly pursues us. We experience it in, in reflexes that aren't as sharp as, as they used to be. Although I won't tell my son that. Eyes that are no longer clear. Ears that don't hear as well. Nagging pains that don't go away. Our mind and our memory betray us. And evidence of aging is everywhere pro proclaiming that death is the destiny of all of us. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe some of you don't yet. Enjoy that. Enjoy that. But the resurrection proclaims that Jesus has won victory over death. Amen? Victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15.20, Paul writes this, says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The first fruits. Now that's a, an interesting word picture right there. The, uh, when Jesus' resurrection is called the first fruits of those who have died. 
And what it means is that Jesus is the first to be raised from the, the dead, never to die again. Never to die again. He paved the way for us, and he says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. Yes, you're going to die an earthly death. Yes, you're going to die a death from this world. But you will be raised again. You'll be raised again. Now, I want to tell you the good news. Y'all want to hear the good news? I want to hear the good news today. I think this is, there's any day we hear the good news, it's got to be, be today. But when you look at that hole, that, that someday is going to hold your body. Because that's, that's what we do. We look at that. We, we drive by a graveyard. Some of us want to, want to avoid it. We don't want to look. But we have to look at that and realize that this is going to happen. When you look at that, you're a Christian. Remember that you won't have to stay there. Amen? You won't have to stay there. You're going to come out of that grave because Jesus came out of his grave. And the Bible says that death has been swallowed up in victory. Amen? Death has been swallowed up in victory. I mentioned earlier that, that Jesus raised his good friend Lazarus back from the dead. Let's read what happened before that resurrection when Jesus speaks to Martha in, in John 11, 23-27. Listen to this. Jesus said to her, he said, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, listen to this, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. They will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's asking her, do you believe this? He knew her answer already, but he's asking her. He's also asking each one of us, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. She believed. I believe. I hope each one of you. A man named Tony Campolo in, in his book, the, the Applause of Heaven. And as I talk about this final story here, the worship team can come forward. He's talking about a funeral service that was held at the church that he attends in, in West Philadelphia. And a man by the name of Clarence, he was a construction worker. He had been tragically killed on the job. On the day of his memorial service, almost the whole church showed up so that they could mourn and comfort his family. Now the preacher, he delivered a, a powerful eulogy. And when he finished, he did a, a most unusual thing. I want you to picture this, okay? He came down from the platform, and he stood by this casket. And this casket was open, by the way. It was an open casket. The lid was open. He started speaking to Clarence as though Clarence was there listening to him. And he was telling Clarence how much he loved and respected him. He said, you're such a great man, and you've had such an influence in my life, he talked about Clarence's Christian character. He, he talked about his Christian family. And he told him all the things he had wished he had told him when he was still alive. But he never got around to doing it. Never got around to doing it. Finally, he finished and he said, Now, Clarence, that's all I have to say. So, good night. And he slammed down the lid of the casket. Slammed down the lid of the casket. Then he turned to the startled audience and he said, God's going to give Clarence a good morning. He said the whole church stood up and with tears streaming from their eyes and smiles on their faces, they started singing with Augusto, in that great getting up morning, we shall rise, we shall rise. In that great getting up morning, we shall rise. In a matter of moments, that funeral changed from mourning to rejoicing. Because the resurrection of Jesus gives us victory over life and over death. Understand that. Each one of us, each one of us have an opportunity to, to experience that victory. Victory over life, victory over death. 
Each one of us have an opportunity to be resurrected with our Savior. Amen? Each one of us. My Jesus, my Savior, He is the resurrection and the life. That's who He is. The problem is, many of us don't understand that. If I turn over my life to Jesus, if I decide that He's going to become my Lord and Savior, if I am going to say, you know what? I'm tired of fighting the things of this world. I am ready to give up my life. Guess what? Once you make that decision, once you've decided to live that life for Jesus, you now have died of this world. Died of this world. You are resurrected in a life with Jesus. And when we die, that, that earthly death, there's no hole that's going to keep us there, amen? No hole, because we will be resurrected with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I wonder how many of us out here truly believe that? How many of us are just happy living a life of sin? Because it's so easy to say, hey, look, I'm going to live a life of this world. I'm just going to do what the world tells me because people like me better that way. Or whatever it might be. Guess what? When you live a life for Jesus, the world's not going to like you any better. The world is going to hate you. Just like those Roman soldiers were there to keep Jesus in there. This world cannot keep you buried. Amen. I want you today to decide, I am done with this world. I am ready to turn over my life to Jesus Christ. If you're ready to do that today, Easter, this day of resurrection, what better day to make that decision? What better day? I'm asking you, I'm begging you to make that decision because I want to see you, along with all those others who I love, up in heaven. Amen. I want to see each one of us. We're going to be dancing the streets of gold. Because of what Jesus did for us. Because of what he did for us. Are you ready to make that decision today? Turn away from a life of sin. Oh, the easy life of sin. I'm asking you to go down that hard life. That hard life where you have to follow Jesus. It's hard because the world won't like it. It's easy because I can have eternity in heaven. You ready to make that decision? Come forward today. Don't wait. Pray with somebody next to you. There are people who love you, who want to pray with you, who want to see you there. Turn away from that life of sin. Maybe I'm a believer and I just have turned away as a believer too. I've I've slid backwards, whatever you want to call it, okay? I'm ready to turn over my life to Jesus fully. Today's the day to do that. Maybe you need help. Maybe you want to be part of something that is growing, that is big. And you know what it is? It's being part of this body of Christ. I see it. Not only growing numerically, but also spiritually. Because you decided to give over your life to Christ. You need people around you that can help you. That can be with you. That can allow you to use your gifts in a way that you can't use them in this world because these are heavenly gifts, by the way. These are spiritual gifts. They can only be used because God has allowed you to have them. And you need to be with this body. You're ready to make that decision today? Come forward today. Come forward. These are all decisions we can make on this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday. We can make these decisions together. We stand and sing this final song. Please stand.